fange jetzt mal auf Deutsch an. Herzlich willkommen und einen wunderschönen guten Abend heute zum zweiten städtebaulichen Kolloquium. Ich freue mich für alle, die hier sind. Vielleicht gibt es ja einen Live-Ticker und wir können zwischendrin den, scheinbar den Stand des Spiels, wann immer das anfängt, auch mal reingeben. Ich weiß es gar nicht genauer. Ähm, Genau, wir fangen jetzt ein bisschen langsam an, weil einer unserer Gäste heute Abend, der Tobias Göwert, ist quasi noch nicht ganz da, der kommt jetzt gleich und dann, ähm, äh, deswegen mache ich ein bisschen, ein bisschen Vorprogramm, sage ich mal. Ähm, ich spreche jetzt auf Deutsch, ich werde dann gleich noch auf Englisch switchen. Wir haben heute zwei Referenten, zwei Gäste da, die auf Englisch vortragen werden, die, glaube ich aber, ähm, you do understand German questions, right? Ja. Yeah die also deutsche Fragen verstehen, aber dann auf Englisch antworten werden. Und wir können im Zweifel sonst auch noch mal hin und her übersetzen. Ähm, genau, ich versuche das hier mal. Da ist sie. So. Hm, ich krieg's nicht hin. Auch technische Hilfe. Genau. Okay. So, but, um, but again, also das Thema ist äh, heute nach wie vor City Makers, also wie Städte Stadt machen. Und ach, in die Richtung heute. Und ähm, heute haben wir eben drei, einmal quasi Hamburg, Rotterdam und Brüssel, also drei große europäische Städte zu Gast, ähm, die sozusagen berichten werden, ähm, wie sie das machen. Und auf ähm, Genau, so, so, ich habe eigentlich einfach nochmal die Aufgabenstellung oder die Fragestellung auf Englisch übersetzt, damit wir das heute auch für unsere Gäste übersetzt haben. And, and the point is that um, what we are interested in this semester is actually city makers, um, how city do cities. And um, so because cities are a product of many actors and they are constantly in, in transformation. And I thought it would be interesting to actually ask the people who are behind the so-called cities, who actually do together with the city administration, but also the politicians um, who have to do the transformation we are all talking about in the in the current time. So, and um, also, we do know that a lot of cities are in competition to each other. And actually, I'm not sure how Rotterdam and Brussels and Hamburg is ranked. Hamburg is very often ranked as one of the luckiest uh, people um, who live in the city. Maybe you can you know it from your own cities as well. And um, so we always have these kind of guidelines, how we do want to live in the future, what we want to achieve as cities, um, how to have like uh, yeah, a resilient, sustainable, future proof and attractive city. And um, we do have the question, how do the cities address these challenges and how do they actually do the change or do the transformation and who do they work with and who they are, um, who, do, who, who do they work with, but also who do they count on? And also, um, maybe you can also name or we can also hear today some projects which, which do have like a huge impact or maybe they don't have only not a huge impact, but maybe a lot of smaller um, impacts also on. So, so it's kind of interesting, I think, to look at this side of city making. Um, and regarding your, your task, everyone who's a student here and who want to get some points, um, I thought maybe today it's especially interesting because you might find some um, projects which you would like to um, yeah, research deeper and uh, to use as an example in your written essay. So maybe this is interesting today for you from the three cities. I think you're going to hear some very interesting transforming projects as well. So let me come to introduce our speakers today. Um, so as I already mentioned, we have three urban planners or urban architects um, who have a central position in implanting quality urban development and built environment that meets the needs of today's and tomorrow's population in the cities, right? And we also have to cope and be in line with political guidelines and decisions. So I'm very welcome to have to, I'm happy to welcome so far, Christian Boret from Brussels and uh, Mathis van Roon from Rotterdam. And later we'll be happy to introduce um, Tobias Gilbert from Hamburg. And we will start today with Christian. Um, his official title is uh, Baumeister, 
of the region of, of Brussels capital region since 2005. Um, the Baumeister is an independent government official who stimulates and supervises the design quality of urban development projects. So you're going to tell us more about the position, um, I think, in, in a few minutes. Um, and Christian Boret previously held the same position in Antwerp from 2006 to 2014 and is currently also working for the city of Amsterdam as a supervisor for two major urban transformation areas. The one is Ostenburg and the other one is the Hammer Quartier. Um, he's a professor of urban design at Ghent University since 2005, and his career has been marked by a close relationship between theory and practice, between design and policy, between architecture and urban planning, and between the public and the private sector. So I'm very happy to welcome Christian here today, and um, yeah, it's your stage, I would say. Thank you. So good evening. Uh, good evening to all of you. Thanks for the uh, invitation. I will present in English. If you put want to put questions in German, I probably can understand that. I will tell you first a bit about this rather specific role of the Baumeister or the Maître Architect in French in uh, Brussels, not only in Brussels, but also in other cities and uh, regions in Belgium. So indeed, it's kind of a tradition in Belgium, but rather a recent tradition. So the first Baumeister was introduced in Flanders in 99, then in Antwerp. Since 2009, it was a Baumeister in Brussels, then Charleroi in the French-speaking part of Belgium. You know, we are quite organized in a complicated way. Uh, and so the funny thing is, by the way, that the official title of the Baumeister in Charleroi is Baumeister de Charleroi, so it has become even a French word. Then in Ghent, and then since the since 2020 already, they are talking and discussing in uh, the French-speaking part of Belgium in Wallonia uh, whether to install a Baumeister, yes or no. It will take some time. When finally Wallonia will have its Baumeister, we are around and we are ready for export. So the Baumeister is not the head of the planning administration of the city. It's also not the one that it's you could translate it as city architect or but in some cases the city architect is more like the head of the planning administration so the translation doesn't work completely yeah? on the other hand uh, i'm also not just a consultant and certainly not a politician so the baumeister is appointed by the government but working in an independent way so it's a kind of hybrid position I'm being paid to be critical. Um, and the mission is improving or stimulating uh, the, the design quality of all urban development projects in Brussels. So it's a role, a function that is in and out of the system. In the system, because you're appointed by the government and closely working together with the administration. It's out of the system because you're working in an in, in the independent way and you're in direct contact with architects, with developers, with civil society, and so on. So the Baumeister can also be a kind of bridge between official policy and what is happening out in the world there uh, with developers, architects, and civil society. I'm sometimes saying we, because the Baumeister in Brussels is a team, a team of 15 people. Uh, the Baumeister is more or less a full-time job and is also appointed uh, by a public procedure, a kind of open call with an uh, official committee that is selecting the Baumeister and so on, and per term of five years. So the idea is that uh, in the city, perhaps you need two terms in order to have some impact. But the idea is, especially after two terms, that you go away and that an, another Baumeister is appointed. So that there is a kind of refreshment all of the time with new perspectives, new accents, uh, new uh, uh, ways of working. 
So what do we do? There is something like three pillars. And the first pillar is the main one is we are organizing a lot of competitions, architecture competitions, urban planning competitions uh, for public space and so on, for public clients, but also for private clients, for private developers, which is in Belgium quite unique. Might be different in Germany, for, but for Belgium, that's rather uh, unique. We launched something like uh, one competition a week, right? small programs, big programs, uh, also very daily utilitarian programs. Uh, so not just the nice things, not just the museums and the kindergartens, but also the dirty programs. And so that's an important leverage to improve quality, not just it's because it's a competition, but also because the competitions in Belgium are organized in a quite open way. That means that young architects, young urban planners can apply easily. So the admission criteria are rather low. And that means that a lot of young people get opportunities for larger projects or for public projects. So it's really giving a lot of uh, a push to also to the milieu of uh, architects and planners working for public authorities. And then there is research by design. So I hate it when uh, discussing with uh, politicians on the quality of a project, when we are just discussing on the basis of text a policy note of the government or an Excel table with rentability, with the numbers, with the euros, with the square meters. I really think that if we want to have a proper discussion on quality, you also need a map, a drawing, an image on the table. Drawing, making images, that's our tool. That's our medium as designers, as urban designers. And that should be recognized also within the system of the administration. And so that's why it's in the team of the Baumeister, there are something like four people or in fact designers who are making proposals, not to build them, finally, but to feed the debate, to challenge our, our architects and developers, to show what the, to, what the future might look like, to explore alternatives and to explore future visions for some areas. So really the design as a medium, as a tool, in order to influence the debate. So that's very important for me. The last part is a kind of classic part. So, sorry, I pushed this one. Just the fact that your approach was already impressing the computer. So the last part is a rather classic part. It's about a design review, a kind of official advice. So in Brussels, all uh, building permit applications, uh, about 5,000 square meters, have to be accompanied by an advice of the Baumeister on the architectural quality of the project. That's an important leverage also to force uh, developers to have contact with the Baumeister early on in the process. Because I think that's the clue for improving quality, that you have to be there upstream, really be there ahead. When in the, in the beginning, you can still uh, influence the project and push the ambition higher. When it's later, things become compli complicated. There's a lot of money that has al already been spent. There is a lot of work that has been done. Everyone becomes angry. Even me becomes angry because I was not involved in the beginning and so on. So the situation is blocking. While if you do, if you are there in the beginning, and that's why the competition is that important, you can work on quality much better. So some clear words, independent, that's fundamental to the job. So as I said before, I'm being paid for being critical. Of course, you can't be critical every day on every project, on every decision of the government, and especially not every time in the newspaper or in the media. So you have to find the kind of balance eh, in uh, being critical enough so that uh, and and uh, being loyal enough. Some 
in between two extremes, there is a kind of a tight rope walking that uh, each Baumeister has to do. On the other hand, because we are independent, we can collaborate with everyone. So it's a typical problem in big organizations that you have these kind of separate silos. People from the mobility department don't want to talk with people of the urban planning department because they consider that public streets or public space is not theirs, but is ours and they shouldn't intervene and that kind of thing. And because the Baumeister is not belonging to none, is belonging to none of these silos, that's why we can be everywhere and we can really work in a transversal way. And working in a transversal way is also an important clue for better quality in uh, city planning. Upstream, working in the beginning, really when the project is conceived, when the first steps of the project are being taken, as I, I have explained, and that's all, also important. I think you have understood, to conclude on uh, what the role of the Baumeister is, uh, it's about soft power. It's not about real power. So the Baumeister can't really decide something. Can't, uh, so he has each time to build an argument, each time to argue, to convince, to seduce developers to work in a certain uh, direction. And that's important also because it forces you each time to reflect, never to fall back on automatisms or uh, general things, but each time to be uh, to say something that is to the point and that is interesting. And that that is what is called soft power after a while. So things are happening and things are changing because the argument is right, because people are convinced. In the end, that's more interesting, I think, than art power. So Brussels, perhaps you know these kind of images, it's close to the, that's the European Parliament. Um, and uh, as you can see, it's, uh, it's not a cute city. It's not a very beautiful, harmonious city. Eh? It's not like Bruges eh? or even not like Vienna. It's a bit of everything, different scales, different styles, different programs, kind of hodgepodge of all everything together. Of course, that is due to bad planning in the 1960s, 70s and 80s, uh, where developers were ruling the world in Brussels and uh, pub uh, public authority wasn't strong enough to resist them. On the other hand, if we look at Brussels in this way, at the composition of the population in Brussels, that's quite remarkable. Brussels is the most diverse city of Europe. That means one of three people in living in Brussels is not Belgian, so it's a foreigner. Part of them are rich foreigners, people working for the European institutions, for instance, and part of them are very poor foreigners. That means the most recent immigrants. But then the majority, or perhaps better, so only the minority, one of three people in Brussels is like me, is the child of two Belgian parents. So the majority of the people in Brussels, 66%, is not born in Belgium, or has at least one parent that was not born in Belgium. So that should change our idea about the composition of the population in Brussels. So Brussels is about diversity. I think the European city and the future European city is about diversity. So the idea of a harmonious uh, European city is of false idea is an idea of the past so we should cope with another kind of urbanity in europe and that's this kind of urbanity and that's why i think that uh, in uh, some hinein interpretieren this city image of brussels suits us very well it really corresponds to the social the social demographic situation of brussels so I like this image of a super diverse architecture 
of a cityscape where a lot of things are possible, where things are not always matching, sometimes a bit friction, but uh, in the end, one unity, one big city that is having this uh, diversity, a kind of multiplicity. So that's really Brussels. The challenge of our times is uh, here as elsewhere, climate change. So if we don't start doing something about it now, then when? For us in Belgium, summer 21 was really a shock with a lot of floodings in Bologna, also in the Western part of Germany, with a lot of, with a high death toll, more than 30, nearly 40 people were killed in Belgium. So that was the moment that many people finally re realized that the future is not anymore what it used to be. So we are living times of uncertainty. And that's for planners like us, I think a challenge, but also extremely interesting. I'll just wait. Now. And so we are witnessing, the, I think in our practice, a paradigm shift. So it's clear that planning, urban design, architecture should change. We do it, we should do it differently than before. We don't know exactly in which way, up to which degree, and so on. But that's also the interesting part of it. Just to make that clear, how quickly it went. Also, and for instance, in my own professional career, this is a map of Brussels five years ago. And then the urban planning discourse in Brussels was about densification, densification, densification. We have a lot of newcomers, a lot of new people living in the city. We have to build houses. We have to build new amenities. So this map is showing where at the same time there is the highest need of more housing, but also already high density. So the red areas are the, the, where there is a lot of pressure. The blue areas is where we could build more. And then, in fact, it's the same map. It's the same uh, basis, but it's a map we are using now, which is the heat island effect in the city. Of course, it's linked, uh, where there is a lot of housing and buildings, uh, there is a lot of heat uh, effects in the summer. But now, so that that density is conceived in a totally different way, not as a tool in order to add density and to move with density and to build new housing to grow, but as a tool to do something about climate change effects to improve the sustainability in, of the city in that way. So red is now not the places where there is a lot of pressure where we should build and perhaps add housing. Red is where we should de-densify and try to look for opportunities to demineralize and to depave and to make perhaps small pocket parks and uh, to open up the interior of the perimeter blocks and so on. So in five years, the same kind of matière brute, material situation, has totally changed in the way of interpreting it in uh, urban planning policy in Brussels. So this is the slogan now, faire la ville sur la ville. Not expanding the city anymore, but transforming the city. On the city itself, reuse of the city. It's also very, perhaps I could add one thing, it's also very particular because of our uh, complicated uh, institutional situation. Uh, in Belgium, we have, uh, in fact, three languages, uh, but two language communities, three regions, one bilingual city, 19 municipalities in the, in the, within the city of Brussels. So it, we call it a lasagna of institutional layers. And so it's very complicated to work with. It leads also to the fact that the territory of Brussels capital region is very much defined. It's very strict. So within Brussels capital region, you have Brussels, 
1.2 million inhabitants. Outside, it's Flanders. It's another region. So there is a lot of political urge to keep all things in Brussels. When a company with a lot of employment wants to leave Brussels and to install itself in Flanders, that is really a problem because we are losing employment to Flanders. And so this kind of political urge to keep everything within the Carcon Institutionnel, I consider it as a, also as a gift for urban planning because it helps us in making the city on the city. It forces us to find solutions within the city itself, not to push it to the outskirts, not to expand it. And so it forces us to invent complicated stacking of programs, mixity, all these kind of things that are in fact real ur urbanity. And that's also the reason why I love them. I have two subjects and then one epilogue perhaps. The first one is uh, the idea of the productive city. So in Brussels, the, uh, one, one is quite convinced that we should keep in the city also productive activities. That means the productive economy, uh, workshops, maker spaces, dirty economy, jobs for low qualified people, people working with their hands, labor work, blue collar work. That might be the new and fancy kind of maker spaces. Uh, probably you have those fab labs as well and craft breweries and uh, people making special bikes and uh, very beautiful bikes and so on. We have a lot of chocolate things and so on. But it's also about ordinary blue collar jobs. A plumber. We will always need plumbers in the city. You can't repair your bathroom online. You need a plumber. And in Brussels, a lot of low qualified people with, uh, with people with low qualified diplomas live in the city center like, like plumbers. In the morning, they drive out of the city to go for spare parts that they need in one of those warehouses at the outer ring roads. And then they get back to the city, taking a long time because uh, uh, traffic is not going very well in order to do the repair jobs in the city itself. So this is stupid, of course, because they are losing time. It's also bad for sustainability, bad for mobility, bad for emissions. And that is because we planners have forgotten in some way to reserve some spaces for, for instance, a plumber spare parts warehouse within the city itself. So the idea in Brussels is that you keep space available for productive activities within the city with the idea of proximity. And so that's why we have the canal plan in Brussels. So there's a canal going straight to Brussels uh, from Charleroi to the port of Antwerp. It was in the 19th century, the, uh, the industrial basin of the city. Uh, there was not so much waterfront development yet. That is because Brussels is so badly organized that uh, we are in many things delayed in comparison with other European cities. But it's also an advantage because we know that uh, in Hamburg with the Haven city, in, uh, uh, in Nantes, in uh, Lyon, in uh, Rotterdam with Cap van Zuid, there have been these uh, developments for new neighborhoods with a lot of housing and shops and, and, and vibrant city life and so on. And they've been pushing out the productive economy in the city. In Brussels, we have decided, or the government has decided, to keep some air, to, in, to develop new areas along the canal. So they diminish partly the industrial activity to allow a lot of new housing because of the demographic need, but to keep also part of the productive activity over there, something like 10%. So developers know if they want to, de to develop housing projects over there, that they have to include 
spaces for small and medium enterprises uh, on the ground floor, for instance. Uh, something like 10% of the total floor area has to be productive activity. So that's a major step. That's also, that's also the importance that I rediscovered of zoning plans, of a traditional tool like a zoning plan, because this plan is defining land prices, of course. That's, that's also one of the steps needed in order to keep productive activities within the city. The other step is you don't only have to reserve the land, you also have to prove that it is feasible, that it is quality housing, and that it is architecturally interesting. That's why with the Baumeister team, we used to, uh, we organized a set of uh, architectural competitions that were looking for, for real solutions. And so one of them is, uh, this is a, a local brewery, Brussels Beer Project, a very hipster one. Uh, and we organized a competition and the office at one is Office Kerstin Geers and David van Zeveren. Also a very hipster architectural office, a very famous one. And so for me, it was really a joy that organizing the competition attracted these excellent architects for these kind of programs. So not just for the museum, not just for the prestigious building, but also for these kind of programs. And it's also a very, of course, it's a, it's a very visible building. And that was also the idea to give productive economy in the city also a face to make it visible, to have it on the first row. There are larger projects. Uh, this one is by a private developer, some 60,000 square meters, and it's housing on top of a layer of parking and then on top of a plinth with productive activities. And so the parking is also, the ceiling height is a bit higher so that it can be transformed in something else when we will need less cars. This project is being built as well as uh, the next one that is in fact finished now. And so this is not vertical superposition, but more like horizontal or horizontal overlapping. So on the left side, you have a kind of small business park accessible with vans and trucks and lorries and then partly on top of that you have housing and both are not hidden towards each other but are in fact exposed there's a kind of glance look that you have can have downwards to the business park and also in the up in the in the other direction there is a kind of interaction between both you could say in fact, that it's, it's a 19th century project, because in the 19th century, architects were able to design both the factory, the, house of the houses of the workers, and the house of the director. So it's a kind of capacity that we have lost, and that thanks to this program of productive economy in Brussels is being revived. The last one is this one. This is on the site of the former uh, slaughterhouse in Brussels. It's also the, res uh, the result of a competition. So on the ground floor, you will have units for food processing, meat processing, but also other kinds of food in the future. So with a lot of uh, refrigerators, a lot of cooling installations, then two layers of parking, the mezzanine layer of parking can be removed. Same story, that it can be transformed into something else later when we would need less parking. And then on top of that, there will be a public swimming pool, an open air swimming pool. And the water will be heated with the heat losses of the cooling installations of the ground floor. So it's a kind of circular solution, one metabolism within one building. So this kind of complexity, I think this is typically for Brussels because we are forced to look for these kind of complex solutions because we don't have space enough to put all these programs next to uh, one another. So we have to stack them and we have to look for uh, symbiosis. Second example, perhaps I'll be, be a bit quicker here because it's, more about architecture than about planning. But you know, planning in the end should result in something built. 
So architecture is important. Um, and it's, it's about adaptive reuse. So we have uh, in Brussels a lot of office buildings, something like 6 million square meters. Uh, part of that, big chunk of that is due to the European institutions and the European <laughs> Commission after COVID and so on and uh, uh, working at home decided that they will shrink their needed office space with something like 25%. That means that a huge amount of office building will become available on the market. That's one thing. The other thing is that uh, there was this kind of uh, habit in urban development that uh, when a building is outdated and an office building is quickly outdated because fashion is changing and or standards are changing, the building height or the ceiling height or the now you should have huge horizontal floors and so on. Um, I'll move it to that way. And so when a, a building is uh, outdated, it's being demolished to build a new one, new one. That's of course, we all know, we all know now also very bad for sustainability. A lot of embedded energy in the building is lost. A lot of new energy is being consumed in order to produce new building materials and to move them to the site and so on. So in Brussels, there is a collective of architects, Rotor, that already since 10 years is putting reuse of materials on the agenda. In the beginning, very much cherry picking. So they go to a site that is being demolished and they remove the nicest materials like slabs of white marble, 55 centimeters here in the Brussels North Station. But after a while, they also start, and then they sell them online and on the market and so on. And now their business has been expanding in a, uh, uh, regularly, and they are also selling now more banal or normal or uh, standard materials. So it's really becoming a business of of removing materials, selling them, and reinstalling them in new buildings. In fact, it's something that we also have lost from the 19th century, because this is uh, Le Palais de Granville, uh, an 18th century building in the center of Brussels. In the early 2030s of 20th century, it was decided that it would be pulled, pulled down. And you can see that the contractor has been sorting out the materials quite uh, uh, precisely. So that's one thing. And then if you could this, read this one, you could see that the, it's set, it says uh, facade for sale. So the facade of the building was put on the market. And indeed is what well, it was bought by a municipality who reused it in the new city hall of that municipality. So this idea of reusing materials and reusing buildings is something that we have lost and that we should put back on the agenda again. It's being done in Brussels since some years, uh, first with the public projects and with uh, like this one, a very motivated client who was interested to do that. So it's a, a building, so all the parts with the yellow ribbon, building for a socio-cultural organization. I won't explain you what exactly. And of course, the building is being reused, but it also leads to this kind of new aesthetics where there is a mix of old architectural elements and new architectural elements. So aesthetics and architecture are moving. It also needs that urban governance or planning governance is moving. Because on the right hand side, you can see the back facade with a strange window below. So this is a huge victory in the bureaucracy in Brussels because it's the first building permit where the window was indicated with the dotted line. So normally in a building permit, you should draw everything precisely. The window will have this shape and will be here. But in this case, they wanted to reuse 
existing windows from other building sites. They didn't know yet at the moment of the building permit which window that they would find. So what they did, the architects, is having a dotted line. Within this dotted line, there will be a window. And so it was a kind of victory to have this approved. And of course, the architect uh, made use of it to do something weird. And they turned out, turned upside down the window that they found. So that's it's about scaling up reuse in materials and reuse of buildings. So that's really going hard now in Brussels, that's scaling up of adaptive reuse. This is a banal build, uh, how, uh, office building of the 1960s uh, that was empty and that is being reused for school, for school. And so what the architects did is not only reuse the building, of course, and then adding a new wooden staircase, but they decided also to reuse, reuse all of the internal wall partitions. And so that starts with a very precise inventory of which panels do I have? And how can I make new classes with them? The result is on the right below. And so also there, a kind of new aesthetics of having old elements and new elements combined. So the old elements in white, the new elements in uh, wood, in plywood. Next step is a big step forward. It's the refurbishment of an office tower in the really in the heart of the city, I think uh, five minutes walking of the Grand Place. So of course it's uh, a kind of error, you could say urbanistic error of the 1960s, installing a huge building within the historic city center, too high and so on. But it's there. Let's live with the trauma. Let's not try to repair it, to restore the original fabric. Let's embrace this kind of errors of the past and make something out of it. And so the developer did a total refurbishment and decided to work mainly with reused materials. So coming from other sites and some of the materials that were no, removed here were used in other buildings. For instance, the heating installation and the ventilation installations so of the machinery that was on top of the building was uh, uh, not good enough in, anymore for this building. And then it was removed, the first building, the one with the window upside down, where it was reused within that building. So it needs also a lot of organizing because you can't store it temporarily. So it was removed from this building put on a truck and on the same day moved to the other building and installed over there. So it's part of the paradigm shift that the way of organizing building sites is changing as well. The last example is in the North Quarter. So the North Quarter is a real business district of the 1960s as well. This is the, this is the headquarter of the Belgian telecom uh, uh, company, so Proximus, two office towers. In the future, they will shrink. They only need one office tower. I've been contact them because it was in the newspaper that they wanted to move to a new building, fancy building, uh, Bream labeled and so on, but on another side. And we convinced them, you can't do that. You can't just leave this very prominent site close to North Station and go to another site and then uh, après moi le deluge, I don't care what's happening afterwards. So they decided to move temporarily and to come back to the same site to transform the building completely, to keep the concrete structure. And in the future, there will be only one office tower and the other one will be housing. It's a project by Nuttling Sridek Architects. And for us, it was again an opportunity also on the urban planning level, in order to bring mixity in that area, mixed use. It's a 100% office area. It's that about office, uh, after office hours. And now, step by step, we are bringing a lot of housing in that area in order to make the area more mixed. It's the same thing that we would like to do with the former buildings of the office buildings of the European Commission.
So there are something like more than 300 apartments in this project. The very last thing I want to say is that uh, in the paradigm shift, it's about big projects and big changes that we need. Uh, we need uh, uh, other policies on the global level. Uh, but I also believe that change can be made by a lot of many, by really many, many of them then, a lot of small changes. So the next big thing will be a lot of small things. That was a slogan at my university in Ghent, saying that also, so the multiplication of small interventions can also have a huge impact. And so that's why I think it's important in planning not only to work on the big strategic projects, but perhaps also on these kind of rules. So in Brussels, the building code is being changed now and small, very small rules with small changes can improve the life of people living in dwellings. It can also improve the sustainability and the heat island effect of the city. So you can't underestimate these kind of small uh, changes either because by the multiplic multiplication of them, then they can have huge impact. So don't despise the small things in change as well. Thank you.